the beam from the Sears Radio Theater. Tonight, a program of mystery with Vincent Price as your host. The Sears Radio Theater will begin... This is Vincent Price. Listen to a celebration. Oh, they just telephoned me from the hospital. It's a boy. A seven-pound boy. Oh, hey, hey, cigars. <laughs> How about cigars? Sure, I got them all ready. Uh, Corona, Corona's. I'll hey, take nothing away. Oh, since hey, when do you oh, smoke? Hey, For you free, I'll do right anything. Right. Oh, here, Frank, have a cigar. Oh, boy, <laughs> Great tribal thing. custom. <laughs> hey, listen, fella. A first kid happens only once in a lifetime. You're about to hear a story you may never forget. Its title is The Old Boy, and I am particularly pleased to present it to you because it was written by an old friend of mine, Peabody Award-winning playwright Art Obler. So get yourself comfortable, and in a moment, the amazing story of The Old Boy. Radio Theater, a new adventure in radio listening. Five nights of exceptional entertainment every week, brought to you in Elliot Lewis' production of The Sears Radio Theater. Our story, The Old Boy, by Arch Obler. Our stars, Elliot Lewis and Mary Jane Croft. the first act of Art Obler's play, The Old Boy. The scene is a research department of a great conglomerate somewhere in Southern California. An excited young technician tells his fellow workers of a very happy event. Hey, 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 oh, cigars! Cigars, like everybody! Have a cigar! Here you are. Great, huh? Great. Me, a yeah, father. Do you do you smoke hey, cigars? where's I Professor Grayson? Then. Well, I gotta uh, tell him. Uh, uh, no, John. Oh, what? Uh, perhaps you shouldn't bother him. You know how he's been lately. His uh, child's so sick. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Come on, fellas, more cigars. I bought two boxes. Grab a handful of them. Young John Ritchie is very happy. His wife has had a baby, a boy. It's a great moment in his life. Only three weeks ago, our baby was born. No, no, I've shut the memory out of my mind. But I must remember. Remember and tear the last pain out of my heart. I must remember. The baby arrived prematurely by a few days. I hurried home to Ellen. To Ellen and my son. Charles? Are you all right? Yes. Oh, I missed you so much at the lab. I, I'm glad it's over. Is it? What? What right have we to have a child? What are you talking we about? We, of all people. I know, I know. We're a little older than we should be, but after Charles, all... Charles, look at me. Yes? All these months, why do you think I've been so miserably unhappy? Well, I'm not sure what you... You know what I'm talking about. All these years wanting a child, and then when I knew I was going to have one... I didn't want it. Our work together, Charles. Twenty-five years work. I, I don't understand. You do. You do. It's in your face. I know you must understand. Well, how goes it? Uh, quite a vocal is that boy of yours. You know, this is quite an experience for me. I haven't had a home delivery in years. Well, we're most grateful to you. Not at all. And when you can, come along. The nurse is going to feed the little rascal. First feeding. Yes, thank you. Ellen, please, look at me. I've known your feelings, of course I have. But when you remained silent, so did I. But must we talk now? Yes. All right. Ellen, scientists all over the world have had to make choices. I made mine a long time ago. Not with emotion, with reason. Now, what sane thinking person denies that war is, is immoral? Or that any instrument of war is immoral. But there are necessities of sheer survival which go beyond those immoralities. Realities of today don't permit us to make the timeless judgment. Who can look into the 
darkness of unwritten history and say, this that I do here and now is right or wrong. Who? So we make our choices and we live with those choices. And who's to blame us or judge us? Or judge us. You've had a hard time. We've a son now. Think only of that. Shall I have the doctor bring him to you? All right. Try to sleep. Well, here's the father. What do you think of your son and heir? Look at him working that bottle. It's amazing. He's surprisingly large. <laughs> yes, indeed. What a boy. Weighed a little over seven pounds when he uh, <laughs> exited. Well, he looks larger than that. Yes. Yes, he does. Uh, nurse, M Miss Carnes. Yes, doctor. How much did the baby weigh at birth? I wrote it down. He weighed seven pounds, three ounces. He looks larger than that. Uh, do you mind, Miss Carnes? I'd like to weigh him again. <laughs> Is that a fact? Yeah. I'll turn the scale, Miss Carnes. Uh, come, Professor. You might as well be a witness. Yes. There you go, young man. Now, don't you move for a moment. All right, Miss Carnes, set the balance. Yes, Doctor. All right. That's what's the reading. He weighs eight pounds, 11 ounces. What are you talking about? Well, that's what it says. Eight pounds, 11 ounces. Oh, my dear woman, it's about time that you could read a scale properly. Seven pounds, three ounces, one hour, and eight pounds, 11 ounces the next. Now, really. But it's true. See for yourself. I will. Eight pounds, 12 ounces. No, no, it's 11. Eight pounds, 12 and a half. Good Lord. Eight pounds, 13 ounces. Doctor, what's happening? Eight pounds, 14 ounces. Professor, look. I remember I stood there thinking it can't be true. Error, misadjustment. But it was true. Horribly true. The balance weight of the baby scale spoke the truth. With each passing moment, the child was growing and growing, ounce after ounce, eating and growing, eating and growing. And this was my son. We now return to our play, The Old Boy. A child has been born, a most unusual child. And the father tells us more of the hours that followed the birth of his son. In 24 hours, the baby was as large as a five-year-old. Simple to say those words, but it's hard to endure them, even in memory. Hour after hour, that little mouth eating, bottle after bottle, hungrily, rapaciously, not like a child, like a tiny beast whose only function was to devour. Ellen slept and half woke, always under narcotics, but the doctor and the nurse and I knew no sleep. Mm. Mm. Won't he ever stop eating? Doctor, tell me, I've never... All right, all right, Miss Carnes, all right. Oh, I'm sorry. You'd better go in the other room and lie down. But the baby will... The professor and I will be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, we'll be here. Perhaps you, too, had better rest, Professor. No. She asked a good question. When will he stop that eating? There's a rational explanation for everything. This is glandular, so it must be self-limiting. Uh, the time, it's almost 8.30. I'll phone Dr. Carmer in a little while. Dr. Carmer? Yes, for consultation. He's an expert on endocrinology. Charles? Go to her. I'll stay with the baby. Yes, sir. Right. Ellen? How do you feel? The baby. Baby's all right. Is he still... Yes, yes, the doctor's right. It's just an abnormal glandular condition, self-limiting. Anyway, we'll know for certain in a little while he's calling in an endocrinologist for a consultation. No. What? No. No other doctor. I don't want my child probed and pushed... Oh, promise me, Charles. Promise me. No other doctor. I gave her my promise. In her hysterical condition, I had to. The doctor was quite unhappy about it. We argued and argued, hour after hour. 
My nerves went tighter and tighter. But it doesn't make good sense, particularly coming from you, a man of science. He's my child. But this is a case unique in... Yes, I'll say it. Medical history. Now, you have no right... Don't tell me my rights. I've told you and told you you will not call in another doctor. My wife refuses to have our baby used like a specimen. I will not say this again. Is that clear? Professor, I must consider that you're tired, but I certainly don't like your attitude. And I don't like your face. Get out of here. You and that hawk-faced nurse of yours. Get out. Get out. Somehow it was better when they were gone. I gave Ellen sedatives. She slept. He did not sleep. He ate and ate. When the formula the nurse had left was gone, I quickly found out that he would eat anything that I gave him. Anything. He ate. And he grew. A day and a night, and he was sitting up in the bed. A baby, yet not a baby at all. The face and body of a ten-year-old. I had a difficult time then with Ellen. Oh, please, Ellen. Go to him, my baby. No, you're too weak. You've got to stay in bed. Oh, what's going to become of him? He's all right, I tell you. Then why don't you let me see him? Hold him. Because it's better that you don't. Not until you're strong. <laughs> It'll never be any better. Never. Why should you say that? I knew it before he was born. It's God's punishment for what we've done. God's punishment. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. There's a rational reason. There's a rational reason for everything. Oh, it's God's punishment. The rational Professor Grayson went in to see his son. To feed that endless hunger in him. I remember, as I sat there watching him, I began to think, was this punishment from, from heaven? No, no, that was emotional, unreasoning. Ellen wasn't young, the shock of childbirth. She had an excuse for what she was thinking, but not I. There was a rational explanation. There was a rational explanation for everything. Good, evil, the greatest, the smallest, in the ebb and flow of the electronic charges that made all things. And then I had it. The new cyclotron I had helped develop. When it had been two, three years before, a protective shield had broken. That was when the radioactivity had reached me. The medical men had found nothing wrong with me, but somehow, those reaching waves had affected the seed in me, the gene. And so this glandular activity of my son's had been accelerated. And his growth was an unrestrained thing, uncontrolled, like an engine running wild. Yes, the radioactivity to which I had been exposed. There was the answer. The boy stopped eating. He sort of stretched. He looked at me. I said, What is it? What do you want? He pulled himself upward from the sides of the crib that sagged with his weight. Suddenly I realized he wanted to be out of that baby bed. He wanted to walk. At two days. To walk. All right. All right. Why not? I'll lift you out. But it won't do any good. Walking has to be learned. Yes, yes. Why shouldn't you learn? I will put you on the floor. There. No. Ah, you see? It isn't easy to walk. All right. All right. Keep trying. Why shouldn't you walk? Why shouldn't you? kept on trying, pulling himself up, falling, pulling himself up, over and over. And when he stopped, he ate. That everlasting eating. And that everlasting growing. In two days, a child no longer. A baby, yet a maturing boy. We now return to the story of the old boy. It is the third day since the birth of the strange Grayson child. (laughs) 
I remember the third day. I got Ellen out of there to go to her sister's. I told her the baby was isolated at the hospital. She didn't quite believe, but in her weakness, she went. And the others, I got rid of all the others. The gardener, the cleaning woman, I got rid of them. But that man, yes, I remember. I know I haven't been much of a neighbor, Professor, but, well, you must admit that uh, you and your wife haven't been exactly sociable. What is it you want? Uh, I, I don't want a thing, not a thing. I was wondering whether I could help you. Help? Well, Anne, my wife, thought that perhaps I should, uh, you know, uh, volunteer my services. What I'm trying to say is, could I help you with the lawn? I know you've had that Chicano fellow, but I've just had my mower overhauled and it starts at one pull. Really, I'd be happy to cut your lawn for you. Okay? The way you stared... Didn't you hear me? Just go away. What? I said it in simple English. Just go away. My son on that third day, the hugeness of him. He could stand now, and when I came into the room, he was there by the window looking out. His eyes large looking out of the window at a world in which he had been less than 75 hours. It was an unlined baby face, yet his eyes, as he looked at me, at the things that were beyond the glass, were full of puzzlement, full of great wonder. The telephone rang. Yes, I remember. Yes. Hello, is that you, Professor? Grayson, is that you? Yes. Yes. We've got a bad connection. Matthew's here. We've got a troublesome problem that needs your good offices. When are you coming in? Oh, I don't know. I beg your pardon? What is it? Is is Mrs. Grayson all right? Yes. The child is ill? Is that the reason? No, I... no. The child's all right. Why do you keep annoying me? I, I can do nothing. Really, Grayson, I'm sorry, but the Pentagon has been after us, and we do... No! I remember I cut Matthew's off in the middle of a word. Words didn't matter. None of them. All that mattered was my son. I went to him. He was still at the window, staring. His eyes turned to me, and then he spoke. His voice, a baby's babble, but all in three days, a child no longer. I... I don't know what you're saying, boy. Come, eat. I brought you more to eat. And as he ate, I remember I sat there, watching, thinking. Thinking of what might have been. The sun that could have been. child that was a child. Father, let's play. Let's hike. Let's run. Just a boy. Father, tell me, why is this? Why is that? Tell me. Help me. Needing me. A boy. Not a thing that ate and ate. No. He needed me. More than any normal child needed a parent. A thousand, thousand times more. I remember I sat there thinking of what might have been. And the doctor came back, full of agitation. Well, question. I couldn't stay away any longer, Professor. All these hours, I haven't been able to concentrate on anything I was doing. How is the child? Has he stopped growing? Can I see him when... I don't think so. Now, look, I realize that I lost my temper. But again, I say you're a man of science. So let's view this matter objectively. I give him my word, I haven't even discussed this with anyone else. Please, let me see him. He's... He's dead. Dead? When? When did it happen? Hours ago. Please. I have nothing more to say. Oh, you certainly have. There's the matter of a death certificate. Do you understand the death certificate? Now, I must see the battle. No. 
Get out. Out. When he was gone, I sat there. So very tired. And then... Yes. Yes, I'm coming, doctor. I'm coming. What do you want now? I told you that... Yes, what... Oh, Mr. Matthews. Uh, Professor Grayson, may I come in? No. Well, yes. Yes, of course. Thank you. If, if you'd come in here, please. I reported your telephone. It apparently has been out of order for some time. We've been trying to reach you. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Uh, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I... Yeah, I beg your pardon. Yes, indeed. I always say that when two men face each other eye to eye on the same level, matters can be quickly resolved. Now then, to the point. You and your wife have had a long and honorable association with our organization, and I realize that unusual circumstances result in, uh, shall we say, unusual reactions. I don't know what you're talking about. I am talking about parenthood at, uh, shall we say, at a rather mature age. I realize that such a circumstance can be quite traumatic for the parents, but your presence is very important to us at the laboratory, Professor Grayson. We have deadlines to meet, and to put it bluntly, we simply cannot understand why you have chosen to be absent all these days. Certainly none of us at the laboratories have a time clock perspective, but I can only repeat we are only a small part of a great conglomerate. And although your activities are remote from contract pressures... In the last analysis, we all have deadlines. I beg of you to cooperate. Certainly, Mrs. Grayson must recuperate, but will you cooperate and join us, shall we say, at 10 tomorrow at our usual report session? I sat there listening to the little man prattle, and all the time my heart pounded under the pressure of frightened blood. What if my son suddenly made a sound, a cry? How would I explain that to this small executive with his simplistic priorities and deadlines? I remember I suddenly heard myself making wild promises I knew I'd never keep. Anything to get that man out of the house so that the door was shut behind him and my son and I would be safely alone again. Well, I'm very relieved, Professor Grayson. We'll see you in the morning. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, one thing more. Yes? Your charming wife, my personal felicitations. I might say that some of her associates are planning quite a welcome for her when she returns. Yes, indeed. Good heavens, I really have been quite remiss not asking you this. How is the child? Doing well, I'm sure. Doing well. I remember the next day, the infernal telephone. Always the telephone. Charles, isn't there any news from the hospital? How is he? How is my baby? I've checked the death certificates, Grayson. There was none issued. You lied to me. Where is that boy? Charles, I want to come home. If my baby's dead, tell me. Tell me. I remember my panic. How long can I keep her from him? In another day or two or three, she'd be back. She must not see him. The glass. Yes, I remember. I hurried to him. The window. Broken. Gone. The boy was gone. I hurried along the dark street, my eyes searching and in me a tearing panic. If the police found the boy, they'd call him a monster. Put him away. That must never happen. He was my child, and the wrong was mine. I must find him quickly. Quickly. Boy, where are you? Boy, where are you? Boy! Then up ahead. Yes, he was there, up ahead, standing at a store window, his face thrust in close to it. As I ran toward him, I blessed the cold and the lateness of the night, for there was no one in the neighborhood street. And then, with his hands, just as I came up to him, he thrust his huge bare hands against the plate glass and broke it. And when I reached him with bloody hands, he was reaching in over the jagged glass, tearing at the loaves of bread in his everlasting ravenous hunger. Oh, no! No! Please, boy! No! Please! Please, boy! Please! I got him home 
and I dressed his wounds, and I fed him. While he ate, I was busy, too. I boarded up the bedroom windows. That night at her sister's, Ellen kept asking questions. I have to know, Charles. My baby, what's happened? What have you done to him? Ellen, you're strong enough for me to tell you. Tell me what? That the baby... I mean to say... Tell me. He, uh... He can't come back from the hospital yet, not for days. Oh. <laughs> but, yeah. but he'll be all right, Ellen. <laughs> Believe me. He'll be all right. Oh. And at home, the boy ate and ate and grew... As I watched him eat, I saw it in twisting terror. How long could I keep Ellen from him? In another day or two or three, she would be back. She must never see him. Never. I took the automobile out of the garage. I fixed up a bed. I took him out there. And there he stayed. Eating and growing. Eating and growing. <laughs> Vincent Price again, and here's the concluding act of The Old Boy. The father, in the agony of remembrance, thinks of the hours that followed. The days crawled into each other. They crawled like weary memories. The doctor thought I'd killed my son. I sensed that. And since he was my friend, soon he stopped asking questions, even on the telephone, and stayed away. <laughs> and Ellen wept and kept on weeping and thought that he was dead and kept on weeping. <laughs> and the boy ate and ate and suddenly grew no more. In a handful of days, boy no longer. In size, he was a man, a man pacing up and down in the prison of the garage. And I sat and watched him. It's all right, boy. It's all right. I don't understand you. No, it's no use. You've no way to communicate with me, nor I with you. You walk up and down. Up and down. Why don't you lie down and get some rest? Rest. Six days, you're a man of, of 30 now, aren't you? 30 in strength and vigor and, and want. I know what you want. But that's why I can't let you out of here. I can't. I can't. Pacing back and forth. Over and over. That day. And the next. And the next. And the next. And I watching him. A father watching his son grow into middle age in a handful of days. For each day for him was five years of life. And so on the tenth day after his birth, he was older than I. And soon his steps were slow as he paced everlastingly from wall to wall. Ellen came home. I couldn't keep her away any longer. She was very weak. She didn't go out of the house. If I could have held him just once, my little baby, just once. Ellen, please. At least let me talk about him. I haven't got my baby, but let me talk about him. Old age came quickly to the boy. Overnight, it seemed his hair turned white. His face became lined and wrinkled, as if life had been a long, weary road. Mm. 
Please, stop walking up and down. Please, rest. You've got to rest. If I only knew what you're trying to tell me. I don't know what you're... I don't know what you're... Why are you going to the door? Go out? No. No, no, that's impossible. I know, I know. You want to see the world you've never seen. They might hurt you. You don't know how they can hurt you. No, no, boy. No. No. Boy. I remember. I still called him boy. On the twelfth day, his steps began to falter. On the thirteenth day, I saw the brown splotches of old age on the back of his hands. On the fifteenth day, he was sitting very quietly. He didn't want to go out into the world anymore. He was an old man, content just to sit and talk about what had been in the thin voice of age. I know what you're saying now, boy. I know. I used to sit and listen to my grandfather as he talked hour after hour about what had been. You're telling me about your life, aren't you? The days you've known. The days of your life. The days of your life. I remember the 18th day clearly. The fog rolled in off the ocean and filled our quiet street with a dark grayness until our house was a world alone in the hand of the fog. I remember I had a hard time driving back from the laboratory where I'd reluctantly gone that day. I hurried into the house. Ellen? Ellen, I'm home. Yes, Charles, yes. As I looked at her face, I knew something had happened. Something about the boy? I want to talk to you, Charles. What is it? Who's been living in the garage? Uh, I beg your pardon? In the garage. I've been wondering why you've been going out there so much, why you never put the car into... I went out there today. Don't look at me like that. I didn't have to open the lock. You must have forgotten. Let the door open. Charles... Who has been living in the garage? I rushed past her and out into the fog, out into the yard. The garage. I saw. It was true. The door was open. I rushed inside. Boy! Boy! Where are you? He was gone. The garage empty. I rushed outside. Boy! Boy, where are you? Where are you? into the fog. That baby, that boy, that man, old man, all right. But my son, my son. Charles, tell me, who is it? Why are you so excited? Who is in the garage? The boy. Boy. Ellen, hold on to me. Tell me. Let me go. I've got to find him. Charles, tell me. Standing there in the wet of the fog, I told her of the baby, the boy, the man. Oh, no. No. At first she didn't believe. No. Then her mouth opened wide. And suddenly she screamed. Ah! And she ran from me. Boy! Where are you, boy? I ran through the fog, looking, looking. He was nowhere. But he was so old. In the morning when I had left him, he could hardly move. Then where was he? Where? It grew dark quickly. The street lights went on. They were faint light in the fog. I could see no more. I could search no more. I came home. I went back into the house. My head... I had been searching for so many hours. I was so tired with this day and the madness of the 18 days that had gone since he had been born. 
It was finished. I could do no more. And then I heard. From upstairs. I opened the bedroom door. He was there. The old boy. In Ellen's arms. She was holding him. And he was talking to her. And as I came in, she lifted her face toward me. And there was no fear in her face. I found him hiding up here, Charles. Our son is home. He lived only two days after that. Close to his mother. In her arms. It's all right, darling. It's all right. Should I, should I get a doctor now? No. He'll rest soon. Why frighten him now? Let him be alone with us. Don't be frightened, son. We're with you. Your father and your mother. And so he rested peacefully in his mother's arms. A little old shrunken man. He died as he slept. Age, three weeks. produced and directed by Arch Obler. Your host was Vincent Price. Our stars were Elliot Lewis and Mary Jane Croft. Also heard were Virginia Gregg, Jerry Hausner, Byron Kane, Vic Perrin, and Peggy Weber. The music for Sears Radio Theater was composed and conducted by Nelson Riddle. Art Gilmore speaking. The Elliot Lewis production of Sears Radio Theater is a presentation of CBI.